Yes, thank you very much, Omar, and thank you to WIDA for bringing us together for a conflict uh, session. As Patricia said, um, there was a conference here at WIDA just on conflict about 11 years ago, and that uh, conference had 100 presentations on all aspects of the economics of conflict that you can imagine. 96 of those presentations dealt with uh, uh, Graciana-style sort of more macro big picture uh, stories, and they were fascinating presentations. But only four of the 100 presentations dealt with Patricia-style micro-type things. And that's the point where Patricia, Philip, and I decided we should uh, do more of that. And uh, on today's panel, you know, it's sort of slightly more evenly balanced. So, you know, that says something about the discipline. I think it says something about um, different perspectives on the economics of conflict have, have come through. And if we look back and reflect on what WIDA has contributed, I think it has contributed a lot to making the economics of conflict a, a mainstream topic. And I think it's great that we have a whole... Uh, session here at the anniversary conference. Um, earlier um, this morning, we heard Justin Lin say that it's not state versus markets, it's actually state and markets. I think in this session, we need to um, look at the state beyond a facilitator of export and uh, productivity growth and providing infrastructure um, for manufacturing the way he was thinking about it. I think here we looked in a much more nuanced way at a state, but also at wider institutions, at uh, no pun intended, at, at social institutions, informal institutions, which can constrain human behavior, the way Omar pointed out, um, in my view, irrespective of our motivation, whether we are greedy or whether we are um, uh, grieving. Um, I think we need to, so whether we are good or whether we are bad people, I think we need to work in an environment and live in an environment where we have formal and informal institutions which constrain our, our behavior in a way that we can interact peacefully and free of violence. Um, and I think that's why actually also the literature has moved a little bit from just looking at incidences of mass violence and sort of the most brutal examples of what humans can do to one another to much more subtle forms, like Patricia pointed out, um, including the, the economics of fragility, understanding uh, sort of you know, how institutions can degenerate and how that affects our behavior and our well-being. So I think that's, that's one of the sort of more promising issues where we haven't made as much progress perhaps as in the outright big violent conflict has massive consequences for, for example, human development, for education, for health, for, for food security, etc. So I think that's now a stylized fact, but it's less of a stylized fact um, still how um, fragility is, is underpinned, what are the micro-level analysis of, of fragility and how do individuals interact with institutions. And I think it was very helpful that Patricia pointed out some of the things that we could work on. I just want to comment very briefly on, on each of the presentations and raise some of the thoughts that, that came to my mind, in part just echoing what, what had been said. So in Graciana's um, presentation, I liked uh, very much that you emphasized the limited ability of, of donors or Western countries or powers or whatever you want to call them to actually um, change things for the good, whatever that may be from their perspective. So um, billions and billions are being spent on fighting a, a war in Afghanistan, for example. Has it done much good? We are not sure. Has it done some bad? Yes, definitely. Has it actually changed the underlying sort of social fabric or the, the traditional, you know, the informal institutions? No, probably not. So, um, you know, what we notice is that there are policymakers in Western capitals who are very preoccupied with a very limited set of policy objectives and who forget about a lot of other things they could probably do much more usefully. So the opportunity cost of policies not undertaken is perhaps one of the largest cost of conflict beyond the numeric cost, the economic cost of conflict, that, which Graciana has worked on, which I've also worked on, which, which actually is substantial. So you, you can see some data, and um, I've done some calculations that the the, the economic cost of conflict is actually akin to the cost of climate change for the world economy. So there is a good reason to, to look at violence and to look at conflict, but I think the, the sort of the implicit cost and the cost in terms of good policies foregone is perhaps even more um, significant. Um, I think there's also a more sort of subtle issue if we think about um, or, or let me put it like this, Graciana, you said you worked in the office of Boutros, Boutros Ghali in order to think about you know, how to configure these things and these interventions and, and what to do, and, and, and that presumably has you know, gotten you interested in these issues and motivated you to keep working on that. But I, I fear that for one Graciana who has struggled with these issues uh, back then in that office, um, there are probably a hundred, if not more, aid agency project officers who worked in some bunker somewhere in Kabul and experienced sort of um, assistance failing under these difficult circumstances and who were traumatized by these um, uh, 
failed attempts at doing something and who are going back to their capitals, who are going back to their countries, who are shaping the public discourse, who are shaping the way um, we understand what development assistance and what economic cooperation and what even security interventions can do uh, for better or for worse. So I, I fear that there's a sort of a, a generation of technocrats, in a sense, burnt by the wrong policy engagement, um, rather than having experienced what, what good can be done in other circumstances with a more nuanced approach and, and more subtle approach. And I think one of the things that I, I fear is missing is um, uh, sort of the, the idea of time consistency, so the big picture, so the sort of thing we're encouraged to do here, to, to look back, to look forward. Policy is very much short-term, very much driven by the very few topics that the senior policymakers and the media can engage with. And if we, if we were more time consistent in our behavior, if in a way we outsource some of the um, political decision-making and security decision-making, the way we do it in, in monetary policy, for example. Yeah, monetary policy is far too important to leave it to the politicians. I mean, imagine the you know, chancellor of the exchequer still setting interest rates in Britain today. That would be a very scary thought, yeah? No, we leave that to the technocrats. And actually, you know, it's good we do. But other very important decisions we leave to the politicians. Why? It's a very scary thought, yeah? So we, we may want to think about um, how can we get more time consistency in these life and death decision-making processes so it's not driven by the short-term media circuit. And I think for that, we need to think much more about the security development nexus and the interdependencies. And I like that very much that you emphasize the, the importance of that and the different communities. And we need to bring these different communities together. Maybe this is not the best place to, um, to, to talk to the security community, although at breakfast there was a three-star Finnish general having breakfast there, but maybe we should have sat at his table instead of talking to Patricia yeah? but, um, and, and ask him what he was doing. Um, Patricia emphasized the, the focus in the research from the shift from the state um, to, the, to the micro level. But I think, um, and I don't think she would disagree, I don't think so much a shift from the state to focusing on the micro level. I think to some extent it's a focus of the state and the micro level and the engagement of individuals and households and entrepreneurs and, and uh, groups with the state and other relevant uh, institutions and trying to track that. At, the, at those levels, also in the data. We have a data revolution, we get a lot more data, we, we can do a lot more empirical analysis these days, but there's still a lot to do, and tracking individuals in violent situations and conflict situations are, is a very important thing to do, so we don't just generalize, we don't say, well, in Uganda it's like this, and in Ghana it's like that. So we can say, you know, this, this farmer, he experienced the conflict like that, and his next door neighbor experienced the conflict very differently. Or maybe even the, the, the farmer and, and his wife or their children experience each individually a conflict very differently. And this is something that we're trying to do in our, our joint work, Patricia um, and I. Um, we're trying to change household surveys or adjust household surveys so we can track conflict through the surveys. And we've developed a module which can do that um, in a statistical way. Um, so um, that is something that I think will provide us even more evidence, even more analysis and can help informed and also policy making. It's a very slow process, it's a very painstaking process to generate this evidence and I don't think there are any, any quick wins. Um, let's, let's think back about the post-World War II period. People um, you know, were maybe debating um, about agricultural, the Green Revolution, or maybe they were thinking about education. You know, should you send girls to education or not? Nowadays we know, of course, you should send boys and girls. There are very few people left who, who advocate otherwise. So that's a stylized fact. But how do you overcome conflict? How do you do reconstruction? We have very few stylized facts in that field. And I think it will take another, whatever, 30 years or so of wider research until we, we have genuine, real stylized fact in that um, field. Finally, Mansub, I maybe have one minute left. Um, two thoughts. Um, one is you talked about uh, vertical inequality. In my research, I found that vertical inequality doesn't actually cause conflict. So that's the good news. But the bad news is that the legacies of conflict, even after the war ends, and this relates now back also to Graciana, it's the reconstruction that often causes the inequality. Because who benefits from the reconstruction in the first instance? It's not the poorest people, it's the richer people in the conflict-affected countries who manage to get going, who manage to exploit opportunities, and who manage to enrich themselves further, um, absolutely and relative to the poorest uh, people. So I think we have to be very careful about inequality, not just because of the conflict, but also because of the reconstruction. And my final thought on, on behavior, um, conflict, of course, also shapes behavior, and it does so in a very long-term way. It does so many years after the end of the conflict, uh, after the end of the conflict, it does so perhaps even intergenerationally. I have an ongoing project in Angola where we see that soldiers who were massively traumatized in the fighting and in the war um, years, many years after the end of the war, after they've been demobilized, 
have very, very high levels of domestic violence uh, to their own partners in, in their own families as a result of having been traumatized by the conflict. And we know that um, fathers um, beating and raping their wives transmits to their children, to their sons as well. Their sons are more likely to in turn beat and rape their wives. So that's a very scary thought that these conflict legacies can, can last intergenerationally even after the guns have fallen silent. Um, final thought um, outside of the presentations. Um, Earlier, we heard that the North must maybe also learn from the South, and I think that's a very interesting thought for our field as well, conflict. Thinking of the refugees coming to Europe and, the, um, and escaping Syria and uh, other countries in Northern Africa and the Middle East, um, I think we need a diversity of ex perspectives and experiences, and I think a lot of European policymaking could perhaps also learn from development economics in that respect. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tillman, for providing us with some very constructive and uh, making the effort to try to synthesize not only thoughts in these presentations, but thoughts from some of the presentations in the plenary session. We have time now for questions. I think we've got, we've got 20 minutes before lunch begins. Um, so it's now an opportunity for you, members of the audience, to ask questions to, to our panelists. Um, when you do so, if you would kindly first just introduce yourselves and let us know your name and your affiliation. And also just to remind you what a question is, it is a short statement that ends in a question mark. Um, uh, that would be much appreciated. We have roving mics, so if you would raise your hand, I will identify you and our mic master will hand you the mic. There's a gentleman here on the left. Thank you very much. This is, yes, uh, I was fascinated with this uh, suggestion that perhaps conflict of the Mr. Brook, yes, that um, we needed somehow to put uh, uh, resolution of conflict in the hands of technocrats rather than politicians. And I wondered whether you considered this is the question whether the UN, with all its experience of conflict, actually provides uh, often that sort of professional recommendation. Question one and question two related to it. And when governments, as politicians, then refuse to take the suggestions, as in uh, Syria or whatever, um, what does that show about the limits of technical uh, advice? Good, thank you. Could you just quickly say what your name and yes. affiliation is? I'm Richard Jolly of IDS, like Patricia. Tillman. Thank you. I'll also try to be short. Is this working? Yeah. Um, on the first point, um, I think the pro problem, the challenge with the UN at the moment is that it's mandated ad hoc by politicians to find solutions where they fail to do so. And that is not the same as having permanently surrendered certain decision-making power from ad hoc decision-making to a more rules-based um, uh, system, which I think the UN could well provide, but it's not the way it's designed at the moment. Yeah? So we, um, and with the Security Council vetoes, et cetera, you know, it remains uh, driven by ad hoc decision-making. So you can appoint a special envoy to Syria and ask him to mediate, but it won't work as long as everybody still has a hand over the button and gets to decide you know, whether or not they want to accept the outcome. Um, on the um, second, sorry, the second question, can you just say one sentence and recap it? Well, the, you've answered it by saying okay. that politicians retain uh, their yeah. hand on the button. The specialized agencies of the UN, the specialized agencies of the UN often are active because they're in the countries anyway, uh, without it being put so obviously back to the politicians, let alone to a security council. So perhaps UN peacekeeping missions, if well-funded and with a robust mandate, then operate below the radar of the international news media long after the ceasefire has been signed and the peace agreement has been signed. And that can be an example of better. Um, although, of course, you can still have individual nation states interfering and saying, sorry, you know, this goes too far now. We can't have any more of this. But, but I think maybe... There are examples where you can see how it works better and um, compared to, say, Syria, you know, where it doesn't work, or Iran, or uh, Afghanistan, or Iraq, et cetera. 
Great, thank you very much. Uh, more questions? All right, I see a gentleman here on the left, and I see in the far right, so starting here with this gentleman on the left-hand side. Fascinating talks, thank you so much. I'm Prakash Singh uh, from Amherst College, Massachusetts. Um, so my question is for Tillman, um, because uh, he mentioned that, uh, that there's a paper that he's working on uh, which finds the increase in domestic violence of, of uh, civil war. Um, so what is the present state of the literature uh, looking at the effect of conflict on intra-household outcomes, and what do you see um, as the future uh, in this subfield of conflict? Thank you. And uh, maybe I also take the second question as well, if the mic could be passed that way. Yes, to Miguel. Thank you. Thanks, so much. Uh, Miguel Nino, you know whether. So uh, my, my question is to the panel. Um, you talk about conflict, um, but it seems to me that it wasn't clear uh, whether you were talking about war or between countries, so across borders, or conflict between borders within societies. You know? So I suspect that going back to the point that Mansu was talking about, like um, if you think about Tilly's renal theory, you know, that war in a way enhanced institutional building in European uh, countries, and then you see conflict uh, uh, or countries experiencing internal conflict, perhaps the incentives for institutional building of, of different kinds. So, and also thinking about the categorical inequalities that again Mansu was referring to at the time, I would say inconsistencies that we observe in young, among young uh, people in, 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 for example, in Africa, um, uh, countries which, which have experienced conflict. So I suspect that the theory will predict different outcomes. So, so my question is, so what kind of uh, tools or analytical tools you may uh, uh, use to predict uh, how to resolve the issues of conflict? Thank you. Maybe we start with you, Mansoub, since Tillman, you've just spoken. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. I mean, the definition of conflict over here, first of all, it should be clear, we are, mentioned, uh, we are talking about internal conflict, okay? Then we have a gray area as to whether we only consider civil war or we consider other forms of uh, conflict. Among them are sectarian conflict where the state is not a target. So, you know, like in Indonesia, there can be Christian-Muslim violence where the state is not a target. And uh, should we include that sort of uh, uh, type of conflict in the types of analysis that we are thinking of? And in addition to that, you have routine violence, which is essentially brawls, bad behavior. And there are data sets on that in different parts of the world. But essentially, we are talking about civil wars, insurgencies, uh, which are rebellions okay? uh, and mass protests. Uh, the, the empirical definition is in terms of, tends to be in terms of fatalities and uh, tends to be in terms of a threshold where 25 people have been killed. And let's not go into the details of how this data is collected, but this, the between Uppsala University and Prio in Oslo, there's this UCDP data uh, set there. So that's, uh, that's, that's uh, as, uh, the answer to the question as far as conflict is, uh, the definition of conflict is concerned. And my other comment would be both to Tillman and to you is that you know, measured inequality, whether that's vertical, I think we have to move away from this dry concept of vertical and horizontal inequality, partially because I'm, uh, I've heard so much of it for the last 16 years that I am absolutely ready to, you know, disgorge it uh, literally at the moment, but also because vertical inequality has a horizontal inequality component in it. And in other words, there's a categorical inequality component in it. And in another room, we have someone called Chico Ferreira, who's done work on decomposing inequality of opportunity from measured inequality. Okay, so the next challenge is, we have, let's say we have three types of inequality. One is because of unequal life chances, one because of your identity, 
and one because of your effort, and there are other random elephant elements like luck and, and so on. Okay, so we have to decompose all these four components from any measured uh, inequality metric. And therefore, vertical and horizontal inequality is, you know, as the experimental economists say about, uh, you know, observed data, dead. Okay, so that's what we need to do, and there, there's a lot of work going on at the moment, which looks at some form of categorical inequality only based upon a crude measure rather than a genie, and look at, if you like, a conflict variable as a dependent variable. Okay. So what is the inequality measure? Usually political exclusion of a group. Then there is some sort of in income inequality, and that's based upon very shoddy, you know, uh, geo-coded data for 1995, which is totally, utterly and unreliable. And therefore, the economic dimension is not really mentioned, as I was saying in the last sentence of my talk. Sorry, uh, I've gone on and rambled, but perhaps I've answered your question. That's great. Thank you, Mansu. I know the, second, the first question was directed at you, Tillman, but before uh, I give you the opportunity, did Graciana or Patricia want to say anything uh, about the first question? If not, that's, that's fine. Yes. Not that. I'll just add a small thing because it actually applies to some of the limitations of the, the work done in terms of data collection. Yes, we are referring to internal wars just because statistically they, they are much more prominent than inter-country wars at the moment. But one of the limitations is that data is collected within borders of countries. So what we're not very good at, and, and it's a challenge for the future, is how do you deal with processes that spill across borders. Data collection, by definition, is done by statistical agencies within the borders of a country. How do you deal then with issues around sort of cross-ethnic uh, divisions and so forth that are within across the borders that we don't have answers, which might explain why we still don't see much results in terms of does inequality affect conflict? Well, maybe yes, but we actually are mis missing all these dimensions, and so far not, not a great deal has been done. Great. Thank you, Tillman. Did you want to respond to that other sure. question? Yeah. Um, so I just want to differentiate. There are two types of issues. One is that I said that um, conflict affects every individual differently. It affects men different from women, and you know, by ethnicity, by location, etc. So within one family, you know, each household member might experience conflict differently. That's a sort of conflict as an exogenous thing. But secondly, second whole issue is that within the family or household, there could be interdependencies and you know, effects from one to the other. So for example, from the demobilized soldier, um, say to his wife, um, if there's uh, domestic violence, yeah? and then that might be transmitted. And now the nightmare from an economic analysis point of view, of course, is you know, teasing that all out and you know, getting a clear identification and so on. So, so I think that's very tricky. Um, having said that, I think some of the hypotheses are quite intuitive, yeah? that there are significant effects, even, with, even in the second dimension within the household. But I think the challenge for empirical researchers to, to be accurate and to spell it out and to demonstrate it so that um, we know how important it is, also relatively speaking to other things, and then it can be put into the programming hopefully one day and into policy making so that we know, you know what then helps against that. So what do you then do to, to you know, if you think from a policy perspective, how do you stop the demobilized soldiers from... Um, in this case, raping uh, their wives or uh, beating them. Yeah. So what is it that you do? Is it about identity? You know, because they've lost their gun, so you know they they are nobody anymore. Yeah, in their own self-image. Is it about activity? You know, that they need higher-paying jobs. Is it about, you know, other things? And so I think that um, that's a very that's the very difficult question to answer. And there we perhaps need to move to different ways of learning about what works and what doesn't work. So for example, impact evaluations in these settings. Yeah, or other ways of of tackling the learning issue. And I think it'll probably take another you know, 10 or 20 or 30 years before we have a very large and robust body of evidence consisting of perhaps hundreds of different micro studies which answer that. So I think it's very early days for this conflict has effects on households and within household literature. It's very early days, I think. Yeah. Great, thank you. We have a question in the front row here. What about me? Oh, sorry. I apologize. Go ahead, Graciela. No, I want to 
respect to the question here on this side. Uh, uh, first, I, I was going to propose that the uh, UNU wider focus on the economics of peace rather than the economics of conflict. But I see that most of you are more interested in, in conflict. So I'm going to forget about that proposal. In the case of the 21 uh, operations that I discussed earlier, uh, in which the UN has had a major multidisciplinary peacekeeping operation or peace building operation, uh, and that some of those operations have been US led. Uh, they, they are all conflicts that are internal, but with serious uh, regional implications. So we have Afghanistan, we have Iraq, we have the DRC and so forth. And, and that is why I, I mentioned this multi-pronged transition to peace because these countries are really coming out of situations in which the international community have pushed them to embark in this political, security, social, and economic transformation. And the social transformation is how to deal with the polarization, the internal polarization, and you know, of different kinds, and how these people are going back to the same villages and how they can live together and how they can address future conflict in a, in a peaceful way. But that is why it has been so difficult because this very large number of people that it's not only norm, uh, former combatants and so forth, but they are refugees, huge numbers of displaced populations and so forth, they have to be reintegrated. And one of the major failures of the international community is that it has managed to get temporary jobs for these people. For instance, you know, cleaning the, the Kabul River and things like that. But these are temporary jobs. And, and after a while, the, those jobs don't exist anymore. And these people are unemployed and willing to go back to arms. So this this has been a major challenge. And that is why it's so difficult. And, and I don't uh, uh, feel you can compare that type of conflict with conflict which is common crime, because they, they, they really, it's very difficult. And I think the, the World Bank has done a disservice in their publication by mixing common crime with these operations that are political in nature. And the policy solutions are so different. And the final uh, point I want to make on this uh, is that it's also different. The, the operations I'm talking about, they are countries that, that's why they are called, sometimes they're called state building operations. And it's very different. For instance, I was invited by the, by the um, uh, private sector association in, in Colombia recently to talk about what happens after they sign the peace agreement and how that's going to affect the, the private sector. And you know, something that Tillman said before, I'm convinced that unless you make some uh, differences, you know, we development economies, we, we, we think of the equity principle where you should treat everybody the same. Policy making in these situations, as I was talking about earlier, is breaking some of the best practices in development. I mean, you have to, first of all, development economies uh, and policymakers usually plan with the medium and term and long term in mind. But you don't have that luxury in countries coming out of war. Sometimes you have to, to adopt policies that you, are, you know they are going to be distortionary in the medium, medium and long term. But you need to do it because humanitarian reasons or other reasons. So, and the same with the equity principle. In these operations, you have to apply what has been called the peace building uh, principle instead of the equity. You have to make temporary um, exceptions for groups that you know, unless you improve their, their uh, situation somehow, they're going to go back to arms. And if they go back to arms, everybody is going to be worse off. So you have to make temporary. And that's why I made the distinction between the, the economics of peace and economic reconstruction with normal development. In, it, that's why in this transition 
face. You have to make these things that, uh, you know, adopt best practices for the moment that break many of the best practices and the normal development. Great, thank you very much. We're reaching the, nearly the end of our time, but there was one question last in the front row here. So we'll, we'll give, uh, go if people if, will indulge us, we'll just go for a few minutes and uh, take that final question. The lady in the front row. Georgia Institute of Technology, uh, and uh, my question is um, kind of related also to what uh, the last comments of Graciela and uh, what Patricia said, um, and uh, that's on, um, you know, we saw the rise in the literature on Mexican drug cartels, and this is um, something like the, there is a gray uh, area between the common crime type of thing and the, like this violence becomes like so important and so like penetrating all um, parts of a civilian life. So the question is uh, what type of need this organization is trying to feed, fill in and how it's different from pure economic crime and how the responses should be targeted because uh, the government has try to reposition this organization as a terrorist organization while it doesn't fit the profile. Great, thank you very much. Yeah. If I could ask our panelists to respond briefly to it. Um, Patricia, did you want to say anything? Uh, thanks, Olga. Um, yes, that's exactly one of the, the examples where our, the, kind of, the, liter the concepts of conflict get a bit blurred, and there's a lot to learn from different literatures. Actually, Statis Kalivas is a great article in the Journal of Conflict Resolution, where he talks about how you can sort of what we've learned now about civil wars can we apply to the situation of uh, the, the, the drug uh, lords in, in Mexico. And there are lots of things, there are a few things that we can learn. One of the most fundamental is what I was referring to about this idea of order. I mean, these groups are coming in. In, into pretty stateless areas in in uh, in urban uh, this this case happens to be under urban areas civil wars happen mostly in rural areas but the common fact that there is stateless and weak weak institutions which are occupied by certain groups and uh, and the the parallels with groups like Hezbollah and Hamas and, and the Taliban are pretty striking so that's one of the areas that is quite fruitful to think about these issues Th these guys are not just criminals they're actually providing a function, a social function sometimes, which becomes really, really tricky to deal with. Um, but I'll stop there. I mean, I think that's, that's one of the most striking parallels between civil wars and this kind of blurred criminology that, that's quite important. Um, I was involved in the favelas in Brazil and trying to uh, put together some kind of reconstruction for, for this uh, uh, problem in Brazil. And the big difference is that, you know, countries like Mexico and Brazil, they have very strong governments, they have very strong institutions. In most of the countries that I have been talking today, you know, you don't have that. You have very weak governments, usually installed by the international community, and they, they, they have to do everything at the same time. They have to build the institutions, they have to build the economy, rebuild, reactivate growth, and so forth. So, so the, the governments in, in uh, Mexico and in Brazil, they have, you know, they have all the resources sources, they should be able to fight these things in an easier way than so far they have proved to do. And in fact, Brazil has done some, some progress, but not so much Mexico. Thank you very much. Well, it just remains for me really to thank each of our panelists, as well as yourselves, for asking such great questions. I think we've received some very interesting ideas, uh, thought-provoking suggestions for how we might approach the issue of conflict and non-development differently in the future. Um, lunch awaits us. I'm fond of quotations, so I'd like to finish just on one uh, that I liked. Um, it's by Bob McNamara, Secretary of Defense uh, during the Vietnam War. And he made a documentary in 2003, The Fog of War. He gave us 11 lessons about war. And the first two are, they stuck with me. The first is, empathize with your enemy. The second is, rationality won't save us. Okay, on that note, I end it and enjoy your lunch and I look forward to seeing some of you in the next sessions.